happy Saturday. The National Veterinary School of Lyon came up in our recent episode on the history of rabies. That first opened in 1761, and it was the first college of veterinary medicine. It was also part of our brief history of veterinary medicine, which came out on June 21st, 2017. So we are bringing that one out today as our Saturday classic. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So, Tracy, I had to uh, run to the vet recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, while I was there, because it was kind of an emergency visit, my regular vet, who I love and adore and have been with more than a decade, was in surgery, so she could not see us. And we saw another vet at the practice that I had never met before, and she's fairly new, and she was lovely. And she was telling me this story about how she had just gotten back from Africa. Um, she had gone with a group to Malawi, where they have been having really big issues with rabies outbreaks. And basically, they go and they do rabies vaccinations on literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dogs. You told me this Uh, number, and it was a mind-bogglingly huge number. She told me it was an estimated 17,000. So many. Yeah, and part of it is that in Malawi, like, it's not so much that everyone's worried about the dogs— Because the dogs are not seen as, like, pets the same way we have pets here in the United States and many of the, many other places in the world. But it was because this rabies outbreak had been causing problems where children were getting bit by rabid dogs. And so they were trying to address it that way. And she and I got into this discussion about how animals are treated much differently and, like, they don't have the same kind of approach to veterinary care because they're working animals. It's culturally just very, very different Uh, And it got me thinking about veterinary history. So that is what we're going to cover today, a very brief history of veterinary medicine. It is not comprehensive by any means because things were developing all over the world at different times uh, and in different ways with different cultures. That's what we're talking about today. There are also lots Uh, of indigenous practices that we don't necessarily have documentation on, but logically we know they existed. (laughs) Correct. Uh, And there are, the problem with that is that a lot of it, like Tracy said, is not documented. And what documentation there is, is a little bit hazy and often seen through the eyes of a completely different culture. So the interpretation is really not entirely trustworthy. Um, So we're not going to cover everywhere in the world, but we're getting a pretty good sampling. Um, A lot of European and U.S. stuff, of course, but also uh, some stuff that was going on in India and China and the Middle East and how all of these different cultures were developing their own means of caring for animals. Uh, And a couple of caveats in addition to that is that we're not going to delve into veterinary care in terms of like the specificity of uh, caring for zoo and aquarium animals. That is a whole other fascinating realm of veterinary science, but it really is its own topic on its own. So uh, we're focusing on care for animals in this one that people would keep as working animals and pets. Like, for lack of better phrasing, because I know not everyone likes the term ownership when it comes to animals, but for this, animals that would be owned by people. Uh, And we, I've debated over how to set this up in terms of like if it would be better to go with each individual culture and their timeline. But what I ended up doing was going more or less chronologically. There are some overlaps of where things are developing over hundreds of years where it's not entirely chronological, but I went that way instead. So geographically speaking, we're doing a lot of traveling and bouncing around the world. So buckle up for that. Uh, We're going to start off with ancient times. In a history of veterinary medicine from 1939, that's in Iowa State's digital repository, uh, the opening begins, the birth of veterinary art probably preceded that of human medicine. In biological existence, food is the primitive requirement. Veterinary medicine sustains life. Human medicine preserves it. An awareness of animal health in ancient times uh, is even mentioned in the Bible. While the directives of Moses to his people to inspect animal flesh intended for eating is about the cleanliness of items to be consumed, it also indicates that the health of animals was on people's minds. But even before that time, humans were obviously considering animal well-being. Once any type of animal was domesticated, the humans who lived alongside those animals would naturally become aware of illnesses that would have probably gone unnoticed otherwise. 
Additionally, keeping animals together would promote the spread of infectious diseases, so it was in humans' best interest to try to treat these problems. And while there's some evidence that people in the Middle East, for example, were applying treatments that could be categorized as rudimentary veterinary medicine for their flocks as early as 9000 BCE, the earliest known individual who is labeled as a healer of animals was, and I'm going to butcher this name because I could not find a good pronunciation guide for it, was Ulu Galadina, who lived in Mesopotamia around 3000 BCE. During the same time, there were veterinarians mentioned uh, who served as doctors of oxen and doctors of donkeys, but none are specifically called out by name, and there really is not much information about either of those jobs. Approximately 500 years later, writings uh, dealing with the care of horses and cattle started appearing in China. Traditional Chinese veterinary medicine has been described as a branch of traditional Chinese medicine, and the two of them developed concurrently, with medical treatments for humans often being adapted for use with animals. This included veterinary acupuncture, although the first Chinese book about treating animals with acupuncture didn't appear until the 7th century BCE. The Ashuna Code appeared in Mesopotamia around 2300 BCE. And in it, rabies is clearly discussed via laws about mad dogs that made the owners of mad dogs liable if one of their dogs were to bite and kill someone. Penalties of payment were clearly established in these laws. And around the same time, but believed to have been written slightly later, the Code of Hammurabi set rules for how much veterinarians could charge for their services. The Cahoon Papyri, written during the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, which ran from 2040 to 1782 BCE included a text on veterinary medicine, including herbal remedies for treating domestic animals. And as we mentioned in our episode on cats throughout history, and as pretty common knowledge, felines were much loved and even revered in ancient Egypt, and cats have been found mummified in much the same way that humans were. Vedic literature dating as far back as 1500 BCE includes descriptions of protective ointments for cows and horses as well as humans. These writings also outline the foundations of what would become general medical knowledge for both humans and animals. And there is discussion uh, of observing animals' behavior when they're sick to learn more about the potential curative properties of plants, stating, quote, the wild boar knows the herb which will cure it, as does the mongoose. So they were basically advocating, watch what animals do when they're sick, and you're going to find plants that might help humans too. I'm just going to take a moment to say, don't uh, don't rely on that in the wild. <laughs> no, 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 they were advocating that <laughs> then. Today I say go to a doctor. Yeah, well, there are definitely things that animals are fine eating that will kill humans dead. Yes. Many Vedic texts were translated into Tibetan, Arabic, and Persian, and there are legends incorporated into the included discussions of animal care. So gods revealed to the the people how to care for horses and elephants, for example. Later, Hippocrates wrote of animal health around 400 BCE. He described hydrothorax. That's an accumulation of water or fluid on the lungs in livestock animals such as sheep, pigs, and oxen. And he also described a cow having a dislocated hip. Livestock ailments were also described in the 4th century BCE, with that being by Aristotle. This writing features a detailed description of an ailment in dogs that we now recognize as being an account of rabies. And rabies, of course, is not confined to dogs, but in Aristotle's writing, he associated it with dogs. Dogs are probably the animal that, that humans are most likely to be having contact with, especially in uh, earlier centuries that were likely to carry rabies. Yeah. Uh, horse wellness, including descriptions on proper care, was discussed by Athenian soldier Xenophon in his book on horsemanship. And in it, he states, quote, And just as with human beings, so with the horse— All diseases are more curable at their commencement than after they have become chronic or been wrongly treated. He also mentioned that horses could have too much blood, uh, which would require a veterinary doctor to address, but these were early times. We now know you can't have too much blood. Uh, A lot of his advice, though, uh, it was interesting, was preventative. He really, really advocated bolstering the horse's strength and health to stave off any issues. Meanwhile, in India, King Ashoka opened the first animal hospital known in the world around 250 BCE. He also mandated 
herbal medicine availability for both people and animals and provided for the cultivation of medically beneficial plants in places that lacked them. In Rome, both Virgil, writing in the first century BCE, and Pliny the Elder, writing in the first century, made mention in their written work of ailments that took out large numbers of animals. And Columella, writing around the same time as Pliny the Elder, this was around uh, 55, the year 55, wrote a book on animal husbandry that discussed disease spread and the necessity of isolating sick animals to curtail it, stating, the diseased must be separated from the sound that not so much as one may come among them which may, with the contagion, affect the rest. Next up, we'll talk about Galen and the advances made in our knowledge of animal physiology while trying to study up on human physiology. But first, we will pause for a word from a sponsor. Galen, who lived in the second century, is known primarily as a physician rather than a veterinarian. But while he was doing the work that would eventually give him his historical standing in human medicine, he also studied animals, often dissecting them as part of his study of anatomy. And this was primarily due to the taboo over dissection of human corpses. Many of the discoveries he made regarding basic physiology applied to many species, including animals. And those discoveries included the carriage of blood by arteries, for example. But it also meant that he landed at conclusions that were really off base, such as his writing about the uterus, which was based on dogs and consequently has some errors. Uh, Also, just in case you didn't know, the word husbandry doesn't refer specifically to breeding. Sometimes people use it that way, but it really means a general care of animals, which can include breeding for healthy lines. One of my favorite things it includes is husbandry behaviors that you teach animals to make it easier to treat them. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things. uh, uh, Many moons ago, I used to volunteer at the Georgia Aquarium in their animal husbandry division. And I would say that and people would be like, do you make animals mate? And I was like, no, that's not what husbandry means. (laughs) Like, we're not, we're not actually like marrying them. (laughs) (laughs) There were very weird discussions that would sometimes happen. Um. <laughs> I feel like that is a, a mistake people often uh, make when they are children or learning language. Yeah, or if you've never really like looked into you know animal care uh, beyond just like I have a dog and I feed it and take it to the vet, you may not know that that's what that term means. There's no shame in it. It just was charming. Uh, the Sanskrit text known as the Artashastra written and revised over the course of the 2nd century BCE through the 3rd century, is a political treatise, but it also includes the mention of a military practice of having a veterinarian travel with armies to tend to tired, injured, elderly, and sick animals. Circa the 3rd century, a Chinese book titled Pocket Book of Emergency Therapies spelled out how to treat horses for a number of ailments, including sunstroke, which was treated by bloodletting. Stop draining horses, people. Yeah. Like, they don't have too much blood. <laughs> uh, I, but they didn't know, and they were doing the best they could with what, the knowledge they had. Oh, I, I was more thinking it is currently uh, about 87 degrees in the room I'm recording in. Please do not drain my blood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you would feel cooler. Writing in the 5th century, Vegetius wrote a treatise on veterinary medicine. Again, this, like much of what we've been discussing up to this point, is focused on horses and livestock. And while he has been lauded by some as the father of veterinary medicine, as a consequence, critics point to the derivative nature of his work as evidence that he really doesn't deserve that title. But the key contribution that he made to animal science was integrating the most current medical knowledge of his time— with an approach to the care and treatment of animals. And there is, by the way, still some debate about whether this is the same Vegetius who also wrote military treatises. Some will say, yes, that's definitely the same person, and others should think not so much that it's just two separate people. By the 7th century, China had a well-defined veterinary services system and an established school for training veterinarians. A book called A Collection of Ways to Care for and Treat Horses provided standardized information for students and offered information that combined all these various learnings and treatment therapies that had been described in earlier texts. And we don't have a great deal of literature regarding animal care in the early Middle Ages of Europe, though there was certainly study of horse physiology and health in Arab-occupied Spain beginning in the 700s. 
Caring for horses, of course, continued to be a significant driver for work in veterinary care around the world for centuries. Sometime prior to the 10th century, a Sanskrit text titled Complete Ayurvedic System for Horses was written by a person named Salihotra, who went on to produce additional books as well, including In Praise of Horses and Treatise on the Marks of Horses. A Tibetan translation of Complete Ayurvedic System for Horses also appeared in the 11th century, and it was translated into Arabic in the 14th century. Yeah, that particular text became really popular and was used in a lot of different places. And another Sanskrit text with an uncertain publication date is the four-part Ayurveda for Elephants. And this treatise describes serious illness, minor ailments, anatomy, surgery, and medicines, and diet for well-being for elephants. It's a really comprehensive guide to elephant care, borrowing advice and techniques from earlier centuries and incorporating it with newer beliefs and observations. And one of the basic ideas present in all of the texts we've mentioned from India specifically, is the importance of preventative care. Cleanliness of animals and of their food with warnings against overfeeding were commonly promoted as ways to stave off disease. In the early half of the 14th century, an Italian farrier named Giordano Rufo wrote a work that was on horse medicine, and this particular volume built to some degree on the previous work of Galen, but it was written based on his extensive work with horses more than anything else. He rarely made reference to earlier works in this text, instead providing his own observations. Rufo also issued a lot of the more old wives' tale style of medicine that had been used prior to this time and favored a much more straightforward approach to animal care that relied on evidence-based conclusions, which is a shocker. (laughs) It's not really a shocker. So this was really a big step forward. Yeah, there were definitely a lot of, uh, you know, kind of mystical style. Uh, There were even some horoscope-based, like, animal care things that had been going on. And he was like, no, 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 just look at the horse, see what is wrong. Yeah. Address the problem. We have, uh, we've dropped, we've name-dropped the podcast Sawbones a lot. (laughs) Um, But they have so many amazing shows that are about various treatments largely that came to popularity before we really had an evidence-based system of medicine in the West. Yeah. As for other parts of the world, there were veterinarian texts in the 14th century Mamluk period when the Islamic Empire was in power in large portions of Africa and Asia. And these even include illustrations of horses being given medicine through a tube inserted into the animal's mouth. And the writing that explained this illustration said that this was an effective way to administer treatments to resistant animals. Texts of Hippocrates and Galen also circulated through the Islamic Empire, translated into Arabic. And unlike European animal care, which focused on horses and livestock, it appears that in parts of Africa and Asia where those texts were available, the ideas in them were applied to all kinds of animals, including horses and livestock, but also cats and dogs. Yeah, and even birds. I mean, they really, it was a much more diversified uh, approach to caring for animals than just focusing on on the working animals of livestock. Uh, Jos van Gistel, who was a Flemish man, whose name I've probably butchered, uh, who traveled through the Islamic Empire for four years in the 1480s, actually mentioned a cat shelter in his writings about Damascus. This shelter was adjacent to a hospital for the poor. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, and it's It's mentioned in several places that this is probably the first known cat shelter specifically in the world, but there's always the possibility there were others that we just haven't, didn't stumble across in our writings. There were also practitioners of animal medicine who specialized in things such as horse obstetrics. Since horses were a vital part of the culture, it makes sense that their care might be more specialized than the more general medicine practiced on other animals. Overall, the Islamic Empire had a fairly comprehensive approach to caring for animals of all kinds. And books on horse care and anatomy continued to be produced in Europe during this time as well. And the movable type printing press meant that such books could be shared with a wider audience than ever before. Carlo Ruini of Bologna wrote a two-volume examination of equine physiology titled Anatomy of the Horse, Infirmity, and Its Remedies. When he wrote it is still a little bit unclear. Uh, It wasn't published until after his death in 1598, but it was translated and republished throughout the 1600s. Volume one of Ruini's in-depth work is dedicated to describing equine anatomy, 
while Volume 2 focuses on identifying and treating disease. Much of the science discussed regarding horse ailments is based on the four humors, choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancholic. So there was a lot of work still to be done. <laughs> yeah, uh, again, advanced for the time. Uh, and it was one of those things where these books that were circulating were kind of enabling people to care for their own animals outside of their being necessarily like veterinarians. In the late 1700s, Philippe Etienne Lafosse, the son of a farrier, uh, wrote a number of books about horse care, featuring colored plates uh, to illustrate the text. And other writers quickly followed with their own books about equine health and illness. But even though there was more and more information being made available in Europe at the time, there was still no formalized course of study for animal care. Remaining ahead of Western practices, Asian veterinary practices really expanded by the mid-1700s to include standardized care of smaller animals, such as dogs and cats, in addition to the larger livestock species. And we're about to talk about why and how Europe finally established formal veterinary training. But before we do, let's pause for a word from one of our sponsors. The catalyst for veterinary schools in Europe was, in fact, illness. As rinderpest, scabies, pneumonia, and other ailments became common enough in their outbreaks as to sometimes be described as plagues, it became apparent that doctors educated and specializing in animal care were needed. To that end, the first established College of Veterinary Medicine opened in Lyon, France in 1761. It was set up in what had once been a hotel and then had been converted into a house. Students from around Europe, which 38 of them in all, were enrolled when it opened. Early courses at the college included dissection, pharmacy, surgery, and horsemanship, among others. And the school was so successful that the Lyon Veterinary College was made a royal school by King Louis XV. Just four years after the school at Lyon opened, a second was established in Alfort, France, in 1765 to meet demand. Claude Bourgeois, the founder of the veterinary school at Lyon, had taken something of a gamble. The ongoing financing of the school was unstable at best when it opened, and so one of the ways he proved its worth was putting his students to work using their newly acquired knowledge to address outbreaks of renderpest, After only six months, he was able to show quite clearly the benefits of their work, which is how things took off so quickly. Yeah, those students were basically like working actively at the same time they were learning. So they were really, really uh, learning on the job and helping to address problems that were going on in the area around them. And this success of the French schools led to the establishment of schools throughout Europe. By the end of the 1770s, there were veterinary colleges in Dresden, Copenhagen, Hanover, and Vienna. Budapest, Berlin, Munich, and London all had veterinary schools by the end of the 18th century. And from there, the educational offerings continued to expand on the European continent. The first veterinary school in North America was established in Ontario, Canada in 1862. So it took almost 100 years before North America got its own veterinary college. As for the United States, it really wasn't until after the Revolutionary War that there was enough density in domesticated animals for people to see animal-based disease events and the need for specialized medicine to address them. Colonists had managed their own animals up to that point, but as the new nation began to grow and the animal population grew along with it, needs changed. Early on, the low-prestige jobs of cow leech and farrier developed to see to the needs of cows and livestock in the case of the cow leech and horses in the case of the farrier. But there was no schooling associated with either job. They were largely based on intuition and guesswork. In 1795, an outbreak of Texas cattle fever had moved from the south, where it was normally seen farther north, into both Pennsylvania and Maryland. And this resulted in the first legislative act uh, connected to animal disease in the United States. North Carolina's legislature forbade cattle that had passed through areas with longleaf pine into or through their state. While it was not yet known that Texas cattle fever was caused by a protozoan parasite, the connection that ticks were involved had been figured out. And ticks were known to thrive in longleaf pine forests. So that is why if uh, cattle had been driven through such forests, they were not allowed in North Carolina. Incidentally, it would be another century before that protozoan cause of Texas cattle fever was identified by a pathologist named Theobald Smith. 
But as the United States headed into the 1800s, even though there were no veterinary colleges in the country, European educated veterinarians offering care of livestock started to set up practices. These were primarily in metropolitan areas along the East Coast. Because it was a new industry and was unregulated in the States, there were plenty of people claiming to be veterinarians who had no real schooling or credentials to speak of. Yeah, there are some pretty disturbing stories uh, that I did not include here. But, you know, basically people showing up and going, yeah, I'm a horse dentist. I'll pull your horse's teeth. Um, That really may have had some practical experience but had no formal training at all. Uh, The New York College of Veterinary Surgeons was established in 1857. And from then to the early 1900s, dozens of schools opened throughout the United States, and additional regulation established more consistency across all colleges for comprehensive training. Between 1866 and 1934, 20,762 people graduated from U.S. veterinary colleges. In 1863, the American Veterinary Medical Association formed after a number of veterinarians had been corresponding with one another and realized that an official affiliation might be beneficial. Forty delegates met in New York for the first meeting. From They were from New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maine, Ohio, and Delaware. And just as European livestock uh, being ravaged by illness led to the birth of the veterinary college, outbreaks of disease among animals in the U.S. led to the establishment of the Bureau of Animal Industry. After decades of fighting off one epizootic after another, the BAI was formed in 1884 with the signing of the Animal Industry Act by President Chester A. Arthur. Since anesthesia wasn't used in the treatment of humans until the mid-1800s, animals were definitely not getting yet in the West either. Sedatives had been used for animals to varying degrees in other parts of the globe, though. Many of the untrained and unethical people who were claiming to be veterinarians in the United States were undoubtedly causing many horses and other livestock a good deal of trauma because of all this a clear example of how medical charlatanism was a danger to animals as well as to people. In 1903, the first woman to graduate from veterinary school in the United States was Dr. Mignon Nicholson, who earned her degree from MacKillop Veterinary College in Chicago. But this didn't exactly open the floodgates to women veterinarians. In 1915, there were a total of four women who graduated from U.S. veterinary schools and went into practice. So even 12 years later, Only four. In 1904, China's first Western-style veterinary medical school opened, and its focus was primarily on horse care. While this was a move toward modernization, in quotation marks, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine was also still quite common. On October 4th of 1917, the U.S. Army Veterinary Corps was established. This was not, however, the first time animal care was included in parts of the U.S. military. Farriers had been Army personnel as far back as the late 1700s. On December 21st, 1922, Dr. Aline Cust became the first woman to graduate from the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, becoming Great Britain's first woman veterinarian. She was 54 at the time and had been denied the opportunity to sit for her examinations 20 years prior when she actually finished her initial schooling in veterinary science in Edinburgh. Yeah, she is someone I'm, I would potentially like to do as a topic on her own later. But basically, she had been working in the field that 20 years, but had never been allowed to actually take her final exams and graduate veterinary school, even though she had done all of the coursework. In 1939, I ran across this and it struck me as kind of fascinating. It was estimated that the cost of a veterinary education in a German school was around $12,000, a sum that seems paltry by today's standards, but really was a very huge investment at the time. During China's Cultural Revolution, which we covered a while back in a four-part series, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine as well as traditional Chinese medicine for people were banned. After the Cultural Revolution, however, many practitioners of both veterinary medicine and human-focused medicine once again turned to traditional methods to enhance their modern therapies. This approach came to be called complementary and alternative veterinary medicine or integrated medicine. By the middle of the 20th century, veterinary schools were well-established throughout the globe. And while World War II had fostered a surge in women working as veterinarians, that dropped off in the 1950s, but then built back up over time. 
Today, there are roughly an equal number of women and men in veterinary practice in the United States, although veterinary schools actually have 70 to 80 percent women students. As post-World War II leisure lifestyles developed, the place of pets became a lot more elevated in Western culture, and consequently, there was a significant growth of small animal practices to care for beloved household pets that really started in the 1950s. Where most veterinarians prior to that time were large animal caregivers, things began to shift to the point where now most veterinary school graduates are likely headed into small animal practice. In the last five decades, the science of treating animals has also expanded significantly. Today, there are specialist veterinarians in almost any field you would find for the treatment of humans. So dental specialists, neurologists, and oncologists are all available to provide animals with specialized treatment, as well as a host of other specialty areas of service. Consequently, it's estimated that Americans will spend $16.62 billion, that is billion with a B, on veterinary care in 2017. Yeah, we have come a long way. It's uh, it's fascinating to me to think about, like I said, when I had that discussion with the vet that we saw recently, uh, how here in the United States, uh, not everywhere, but certainly for a lot of people, you know, our pets are very sort of pampered and, and fussed over and loved and adored. And so it, it was sort of a, a good reminder to me when she was talking about how, no, no, animals there are, are there for protection of their property and territory, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so it was a good reminder to me that, like, not everyone is is operating under the same circumstances. Yeah, I read a really fascinating article recently that was about uh, efforts to make uh, veterinary care more available in indigenous communities, mm-hmm. um, which sometimes have their own, uh, like, indigenous practices for caring for animals, um, and h- how to find ways to do that that are simultaneously respectful um, and make sure that animals are able to get uh, like Western style care when it's actually needed. Um, yeah. Because uh, as with a lot of things, there are some places where like the 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 Western style medicine is the thing that's going to fix the problem, um, and times where like the the more traditional practice is going to be completely fine. So uh, that was fascinating. Also, yeah, one of the pieces that I read uh, about veterinary medicine in China talked about the traditional style uh, of treatments that included things like herbal therapies and acupuncture and other things uh, versus modern medicine and how in some places, particularly in in more rural or uh, less financially um, abundant communities, sometimes they relied on the more traditional types because they were more cost effective. Uh, You know, they were much more affordable to people, but that they are similarly trying to continue to integrate both traditional and modern med- medical practices to kind of create a more holistic approach to the whole thing uh, and offer options. It's really a fascinating uh, field when you think about that. Like, I, I again, I think of it as so much of my experience comes from Western medicine. And it's like, yes, my cat has a problem. We don't know what's wrong with his back. Let's get an MRI. Uh, but <laughs> but that's, that's not always how everyone thinks. And it's good to be reminded of that. Um, by the way, my cat had an MRI is just fine. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.